I want to talk a, a little bit about what I have seen in my experiences as a, as a clinical researcher. I'm very deliberate about identifying myself as a clinical researcher because there are very few of us as African Americans who can honestly say that they've been able to support and sustain themselves in the biomedical research enterprise. Um, and so when we talk about these issues of being high achieving and what that means, and I heard Professor Rose talk about um, the environment and the milieu that you find yourself in in these kinds of settings, it affects those of us who are at this stage in my life, I guess I'm mid-career. Um, but, um, so it continues throughout. It's a, I think it's a life course trajectory that we're dealing with. So I want to talk about this in the context of um, stages, challenges, and tools. Um, so when I, and there are three stages I'm going to talk about. So the K through 12, the college academic environment, and then uh, post-college, early adulthood. So in the first stage, and pardon me because I'm going to reference my notes, um, in K through 12, some of the challenges include being an African American or a student of color who has received this label of being high achievement and what that means, right? So you're sort of set apart. I could honestly sit here and name for you the eight African American kids that I grew, who I grew up with who were the high achieving kids. I know all of them. We're still in touch. They're all professionals. Mm -hmm. We're all on Facebook. Um, I know who they are. The fact that I can name all of them says a lot. Um, so, there's having that label. There's the racial isolation that often comes along with that. I can't tell you how many times. I come from a place called Virginia Beach, Virginia. Mm. There was a very small African American population. It's much bigger now. Um, the other racial ethnic group that was there was Filipinos. Um, so it was pretty much blacks, whites, and Filipinos in Virginia Beach. I'm a public school product, so um, all of those kids were there, but in the, we were tracked. So I'm old enough, I don't know if they still do that, <laughs> but I'm old enough where we had classes that were called, embrace yourselves, average, superior, and remedial. Mm -hmm. And you know what that means, right? And so we weren't sophisticated enough to have the bluebirds, the robins, <laughs> and the blackbirds, and everybody knows which group the blackbirds were, right? So, okay. Okay, we're going to keep it real today. So in any event, um, we were trapped. And so I was in the high track. Um, and you're isolated, right? You go in class, literally, they're the same eight kids I talked about, unless we were so, had the same schedule, there were always just one or two of us in these classes. So there's the isolation that comes with being a high-achieving student of color. Um, there's the myth of you're going to do well as long as you work hard. There's some truth to that, but you find yourself, and many students of color find themselves hitting these walls that they can't explain, why am I hitting these walls? Right, so there are opportunities. Governor's school was a big thing in Virginia. But you have to be nominated by your teachers, mm -hmm. right, to compete for governor's school. So if your teachers did not envision you as a student of color, as a person who should be, mm -hmm. I see my brother from uh, UVA nodding, you weren't going to get that nomination. I don't care if you did have straight A's. Right, so there are those kinds of challenges. Um, versus the reality um, of being constantly questioned. I will never forget being in the classroom. Uh, this was probably 10th grade. There was a young lady who came in the classroom who, who was always either an average or remedial class. She was not a woman of color. And I said to her, oh, I'll make up a name. Jenny, it's, it's nice to see you in here. And her friend immediately shot back to me. She has just as much right to be in here as you do. You don't really need to be in here either. So there was sort of this idea that for students, for students of color, the fact, and this was, I should have said, this was an AP course, right? Why are you here? She's supposed to be here because of what she looks like. You, however, are questionable. We, I'm not sure you need to be in here. And that, that questioning happens throughout the academic career. So the tool, and then there are the tools. So those are some of the challenges. I've shared the stage, I've shared some of the challenges, and then there are the tools. So there are tools that our young, high-achieving students of color have and there are tools that I feel like they need that we don't always talk about. So in terms of tools that they have, clearly they have a strong work ethic. Clearly they have loving families. Often they have support. Support can come in the form of faith communities. I do a lot of my clinical research with African American faith communities. Um, it can come in the form of organizations. Many of you are probably familiar, and if you don't know, you just pull an African American person to the side and ask what it is, Jack and Jill. <laughs> right? Uh, you have African-American fraternities and sororities. 
Um, and these are organizations and entities that help high achieving African American young men and women. And I'm sure there are similar ones for other groups of children of color um, that provide support. So those are tools that, that we have in these communities. Then there are tools that I feel like our young people need. Those include things like racial socialization and an understanding of who they are as racial beings. Right? It doesn't have to be the sole focus, right? I am an African American woman, but that's not all of who I am. That's a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. So helping young people understand how they fit in the, con in the larger context. Mm -hmm. um, there's gender identity. What does it mean to be a young black woman? And what kinds of things go with that? Our young people need coping skills. We have to teach our young people coping skills. That was not necessarily something that I had. I learned over time and developed those, particularly being in a mental health setting or being in a mental health profession, they need coping skills. And one of the most important is our young people need uh, communication outlets. They need to have people they can talk to when they're frustrated. I think this is particularly true for our young African American and Latino men. You don't have to swallow everything, mm -hmm. right? It is okay to say that I'm having a hard time. It is okay to say that I'm struggling, I'm recalling my own experience, in calculus, <laughs> and I need a tutor. It's okay to have a tutor, right? So as Professor Rose shared in her opening comments, when you need those kinds of things, that doesn't mean you're a failure, right? For other cultural groups, I think that there's not necessarily that stigma attached to having to have support. There's a recognition that the support is gonna get me to where I wanna go. But for African-American and Latino youth, often it is, I gotta do it all myself. Mm -hmm. If anybody sees a fissure or a crack mm -hmm. in this facade, it's a wrap. Mm -hmm. I'm never gonna be able to be successful. All right, so I was gonna give examples, but we have 20 minutes, so we'll come back to that. All right, so then there's the second stage. The next stage I would suggest we're dealing with is being in an elite institution. Whatever that is for you. For many of us, it is, uh, many young people of color, it is Ivy League institutions, those are elite. That's the most elite of the most elite. For others of us, it's HBCUs. And we sort of have our, now this is a joke that we say at Howard, the black Ivies, right? And I'm not gonna say what they are because I'm gonna leave one out, somebody's gonna get mad at me, so. Right. <laughs> the only one I'm gonna say is mine, Howard University. <laughs> say there you go. <laughs> yeah. um, but, there's this, <laughs> but there's this idea when you get to these institutions, you have arrived, right? You mm -hmm. have. Right? So, I, so Professor Rose shared, I think I'm saying this accurately, being a uh, uh, mentioned first generation college student. I happen to be a fifth generation college student on one side of the family, going all the way back to just the end of, uh, just after the end of slavery. And it, it also makes me think as an aside of this context, Professor Rose talked about uh, Lorraine Hansberry, and all the black folks know who that is and they should, I agree. That's not just your universe, that's all of us. Okay. Um, but there's this thread <laughs> Right? And so when you think about what that means, and what kind of pressure that is. Like I heard that constantly when I was growing up. And the other thing I heard was, Alfie, you can go to college wherever you want to, but my money is going to an HBCU. <laughs> so there was sort of that pressure. We didn't have, and my dad's going to kill me if he ever sees it. But we didn't have this idea that there were lots of colleges to go to. The only colleges you were going to look at in my family were HBCUs, and for anybody who's not aware mm. that's a historically black college and university. That was it. So all of the people who have college degrees, this is on my mother's side of the family, she's deceased. They all went to HBCUs. Um, so there's this idea that you've arrived. In some ways, for many of our young people, there's this idea that you have proven those who love you right. They knew you had it in you. They knew you were gonna be successful. They knew, just like these mm. young brothers I've seen, like the one in New York who got into all of the Ivies, there's one who got into five, there was a mm -hmm. young brother in D.C. who got into four. Like you've overcome mm -hmm. these, for some of one of them, the brother in D.C., overcome all these obstacles. You've arrived. For other people, mm -hmm. you have proven them wrong. Mm -hmm. right? And you're carrying all of that with you. There were people who said you were never gonna amount to anything. Mm -hmm. Right, you were just, you didn't come from anything, your family didn't have anything. You've proven these people wrong because you've made it. That's pressure. Mm -hmm. In terms, so some of the challenges at this stage, high expectations, very high expectations, especially, for, and please let no, me know no, if you're, I'm yeah, okay. you're doing all right. Um, <laughs> there's this idea for many of you, I'm gonna see how many heads are gonna nod, I'm gonna nod my head, because it was for me carrying your people. Every time you walk <clears> into a classroom, you, I see a sister nod, you are, you speak for every black person that's ever walked the face mm -hmm. of this earth. 
I can remember being a postdoc. This wasn't, wasn't that long ago. We were having a conversation, and the conversation, I was the only postdoc in the room. In a room of about 15 people, this is when I was at another institution that I won't name. Um, and if anybody looks up my bio, they're going to know what I'm talking about, but I just won't <laughs> name it. I won't name it. Um, everybody was a senior researcher, senior clinical investigator, and the conversation tur turned to how are we going to analyze the data with the students, the children of color. Every head in that room, mm -hmm. <laughs> Alfie, what do you think? And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Seriously, I'm supposed to answer that question about what we're supposed to do with this data? I'm a postdoc, right? So there, there's that pressure. Um, there's the pressure, I think, for many of us of carrying your family, mm -hmm. particularly for first-generation students of color. Right? All, all, we're all sort of riding on you to do well. We're betting on you to do well. Mm -hmm. Many students of color that I see clinically will say, there's all this pressure on me because people talk about all the sacrifices they made to help me get here. Sacrifices they continue to make, right? I'm living in a world where my friends are jetting off to Paris for the summer, and I go home. It's not like that. Nobody's going to Paris, unless it's Paris, Texas, maybe. That's about it. <laughs> right, so those are not, you know, that's pressure. That's a challenge for our young people. There's also the pressure of you can't just achieve, you must excel. I see this increasingly. I don't remember it being like that when I was an undergrad. Um, but then again, I went to undergrad with... Uh, Puffy, otherwise known as P. Diddy. He was in my class and all the hit men, so there was some pressure to excel. But we didn't think Puffy was going to end up where he ended up, so <laughs> we really didn't. No offense, Puffy, I'm sorry, we, we, we didn't know. Um, <laughs> there's also, so then there are the tools. The tools that our young people at this stage have, again, they have a strong work ethic. You are carrying the knowledge of your past achievements. You got there. You did it. You applied to these schools. You got in. Many of us, there are scholarships and honors that come along with it. You might be in the honors college. You've made it. So you have this knowledge that you can achieve, right? And what I hope that you will take with you is you will carry that knowledge with you, right? Because when you're a young person of color, it's not easy. You have extra hurdles you have to overcome. So that part of what I try to encourage the young people I work with to remember is you've had these hurdles. You have overcome them in the past. You can continue to overcome them. You have to keep, in, keep that in mind. Um, you also have tools of encouragement and support from people around you, your family, these other entities that I mentioned earlier, what you need. What these young people need are role models who reflect them. I can't tell you how important it is for a young person to walk into a classroom and see a Professor Rose standing at the head of the class. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what it meant for me to hear her say in the introduction that she was impressed with the credentials of the people you, that you all had invited to come here and speak with you. We don't get to hear that. Mm. So often we're defending the work that we do when we do clinical mm. work and research with populations of people of color. It is an honor to have somebody that you respect say, you guys are smart. You guys are doing the work. You guys are out front. Mm. You know, I'm smart in my area, but I respect what you're doing. So that's important. Now, I'm a professional in my 40s. If that is valuable to me, imagine what it means to a young person who's still developing. They need to see that. Um, they also continue to need a support system, racial identity development, and maturity. It's not just people talking to you about what it means to be a person of color. It is now you have to understand what to do with that knowledge, right? So it's maturity. You have to keep progressing in that area. Same thing with gender identity and maturity. And finally, um, the last stage. Again, I'm skipping an example. The last stage has to do with, okay, early adulthood post-undergrad. Post Either you're going to grad or professional school, or you're going out there to work. The challenges are pressure to make your mark. Now, for you young people, that's a whole different set of pressures than what we had. I have young people coming and talking to me about they're upset because their first salary out of undergrad is not mid-six figures. <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dr. Breland Noble, I just, my friend got offered this and I only got offered X and I'm looking at him like, do you realize how close that is to my current salary? <laughs> okay, so there are those challenges. There's this myth. <laughs> oh, there's this myth. Uh, when I was at Duke, we used to have this thing that we talked about, effortless perfection, mm -hmm. right? What's that thing that um, is in the popular culture? I woke up like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like this idea. <laughs> it's like this idea. No, did not wake up yes, like this. It took some work, man. I had put this together. I had put 
raise them ahead and then take them out. I mean, I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> There's this idea that you just sort of pop up. Yes. Oh, okay. I think my hair covered my mic. Okay. Oh, well, my thank apologies. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for saying it. Is that better? I can hear my, I kind of hear echo. Can okay. you hear now? Oh, okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Effortless perfection. Um, that's a fantasy, all right? It doesn't exist in reality. Nobody just wakes up like this, all right? Um, there's this idea for you have to marry well immediately. As soon as you get out of school, you got to find that spouse that does have the six-figure salary, and y'all need to have an Audi truck and be in a McMansion, like, immediately after undergrad. There's this, this idea that you need to be doing TED Talks within one year of graduation. We didn't have that kind of pressure. Like, we didn't have TED Talks, all right? And then there's these questions. There's this, I'm totally dating myself, but that's okay. Why don't I have that? Right? That's a, that's a question that these young people are asking themselves. They might have one, it's the N of one, right? I'm a researcher. Mm -hmm. You have an N of one who's doing a TED Talk, and you're mm -hmm. depressed and upset because it's not you. Right? That's not the whole world. That's not even most of your classmates. That's one person. Okay. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And then the tools. The tools that I feel like the young people need to have at this stage are acknowledgement that you have that degree acknowledgement that in this context you are an Ivy Leaguer. You have done it. Where people before you weren't allowed to do it, you have done it. Um, and then you have your network. The tools that they need are a realistic picture of what to expect after graduation. There's a trajectory, mm -hmm. right? It's not like this. It's a little bit more like this. Um, and then one thing I want to just share in closing for the young people, stay off of Instagram and Facebook looking at what your friends are doing. There is research that shows, the, literally there's clinical research that shows, the longer you sit and look at that stuff, the worse you feel about yourself. Stop doing it, okay? That's, that's the tool that you have to have, all right. And then finally, there are these series of, I think, there are these ideas that sort of are a thread throughout. Our young people need coping skills. They need to have open and honest communication with the people around them these ideas of racial and gender socialization and identity. And finally, one I did not mention, but I definitely feel like is a thread. For young people of color, we have to recognize black folks, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, we all have mental health issues. There's not one group that mental health issues are relegated to and the rest of us are free. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>